Welcome to the TDWG Podcast. And I am a man that whenever you give me ruled paper, I write the other way because my name is Paul Davidson. And my name is Scott Norman, and it's a pleasure to burn. It was a special pleasure to see things eaten. That's the first two lines, of course, of the book that we are going to be reviewing today because it was asked to be reviewed on our YouTube channel in the comments. They went in there and said, hey, I would like you to hear y'all talk more about Fahrenheit 451, and so that's what we're going to do. Here we are. So, Fahrenheit 451. So, Mr. Norman, give us the synopsis. What's this book about? All right. So, this book is set in a kind of future dystopia utopia thing um, where the people feel like they're utopian, but really it's dystopic. And um, they are, uh, or the book follows Guy Montag um, and his journey from being a fireman whose job is the opposite of what someone who has not read this book would think it is in that he burns things. Yes, instead of reading books, instead of putting out fires, <coughs> he starts them. Yes, he starts them as he burns books um, and houses and eventually people. Um, <laughs> but he uh, is a fireman that burns things. And that's why the intro to the book, as we kind of just parroted off there, is it was a pleasure to burn. He's describing the joy of burning things. And also note that it says, it was a pleasure to burn. Yes, it is past tense. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't catch that. Yeah, you're you're talking to a person that has taught this book and has read it multiple, multiple times. And I... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get into my Rotten Tomatoes evaluation of this book, Uh, even though that's what we're going to be doing next. I love this book, Uh, (laughs) even though I know it's a teacher book, and I know that certain parts, it's not perfect. It's not a perfect book, but I really like this book. It's a fun book for me. It's a... Yeah, it's it's very interesting. Well, I guess I'll save it so we can get through the remainder of the synopsis. Not are we doing the spoiler-free synopsis or are we doing full-on spoiler synopsis? Eh, if you want to spoil, I don't care. All right, so we'll do the. You've had sixty something, or you've had over sixty years. This is the sixth. Right now, I have my copy, which is the sixtieth anniversary edition that <laughs> Mr. Norman can attest is very well. Worn it is. through There's and all dog-eared. Kinds of little pink things sticking out, and and I bought this back in two thousand and twelve ish. Or 2011. Okay. So it's been close to 70 years. Like, come on. You've h- had a chance to read the book. Yeah. Um, so spoilers. If you want to, you know, go read the book right now. Pause us. Go read the book and come it's back. It's actually not a super long read. You it's can not. You can tackle it fairly quickly. If you listen to it on Audible on Double 1.5. Speed. Yeah, yep. or two. Um, <laughs> but uh, this guy, Montag, slowly comes to the realization that maybe things aren't as they should be as he is forced to burn down a house with someone in it. Um, And from that point... Play the man, Master Ridley. (laughs) um, as, As it continues, he then begins to kind of realize that, in fact, this book burning is not what should be happening, but instead people should be reading them. And he slowly um, reveals his affinity for books and then eventually... Uh, begins desiring to tear the whole world as it is down and and put things back in order. And that all comes to a head eventually when he clashes, I'm trying to be sort of spoiler-free, as he clashes with the authorities that be and turns rebel um, towards the end of the book, only to see, uh, I guess, that rebellion come to fruition in a sense in that the book readers are proven right and those who ignore them are proven wrong at the final say. I was trying to find a specific quote that uh, Captain Beatty throws at one point. I think it's something along the lines of, give a man a few lines of verse, of verse and they're ready to burn down the world. Yes, I do remember that point in his debate. Um, All right, so uh, I've already spoiled my uh, Rotten Tomatoes slash evaluation. Uh, I wouldn't say it's 100% fresh. I would say <clears throat> I would if I was to give this book a grade, I'd give it. I'd still give it an A, but if on like a scale, like a 4 or... Uh, I think on Goodreads I give it a five, but I I guess ninety five percent. I would give it ninety five percent fresh. Okay, ninety five percent fresh. So, um, I I kind of prepared some some comments specifically about certain things. So before I actually give it the overall rating, I'll just give it kind of my my brief commentary. Or is that is that our next section? No, no, go ahead, okay. go ahead. So. I started reading this book not really knowing what to expect. I just knew it was dystopian future and that as someone who teaches social studies, a bunch of people said, this is a book you need to read. And a lot of conversations that me and you had and since I teach this book, I remember uh, many times I've handed you a copy saying, you need to read this book. After we had conversations that kind of centered around the ideas at the center of this book. (laughs) And Fahrenheit 451 sat in my room 
getting buried under other papers for several years, and I never read it, and I think I eventually returned it, either that or mm-hmm. it's still sitting on that shelf. I had to return it because I needed extra copies to teach it okay. that year. Um, and uh, at that point, I, I was like, I don't know if I'll ever actually do this or not. As we talked about, if you listen to our last podcast, I like a lot of biographies and stuff like that and don't tend to do fiction as much. But for this, for you, the listeners, and specifically those uh, or the one who requested it, then uh, Fahrenheit 451 was the topic of readage. And so as I started reading, the first thing that really struck me was for a dystopian future, this thing is, is really artsy. And uh, I actually had a little bit of a conversation with you about that, that I'm not used to reading books that are like super artsy. Um, there, there was one book that I read that was by a spoken word artist who had written a book, and that book was crazy artsy. Um, and this, I feel like almost, oh, and the bunker. The bunker has locked us in. By the way, if you're curious, we have books in our bunker. That way we do. Uh, they can not come and burn them down. So come out as Fort Fireman. You're not getting in. And behind that grate that you're hearing, I have all of the books. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, we have a large supply of uh, the MREs donated by uh Steve, 1989, from MRE Info, (laughs) if you want to look him up on YouTube. Um, But anyway, so it was super artsy. There was just things this was talking about, you know, the moon hitting this and this thing being this and this thing being this. Oh, the moon hitting her eyes? And just all kinds of, like a big pizza pie. Um, (laughs) That's so So, boring. (laughs) All right, keep going. Sorry. But it, it just struck me as super artsy. As I got through the book, that kept coming up over and over again where I was like, Okay, I understand that that was really, like, a really artful way to describe that. I just don't understand why. Um, and then there All were right. other areas where it was super emotive. All right, I'm going I'm to hit, hit on the moon one that okay. you talked about. So it actually talks about whenever he walks in and discovers his wife had overdosed, mm-hmm. and it describes her eyes looking like moonstones. And so her eyes were just pale, and yeah. there was nothingness to them, and it was kind of smooth. And so that was, the, that was the reason why they mentioned the whole... He compares it to the moon, which looks cold and dead, because she seemed cold and dead. Well, that that actually came after. The, I don't remember exactly the specific analogy, but it was something as he was outside. Oh, okay. Oh, it's when he ran Clarice. into the, yeah, when he Clarice. ran into Clarice. That's what it was. Um, but anyway, so very artsy. That was something that was different to me. And then um, <clears throat> I did think it was funny as I'm listening along, and they start talking about the, the seashells. Mm-hmm. In your ear. And we're currently and sporting seashells yes, in our ear while we talk. And I was doing this via Audible, so I'm like, hey, I wonder how the how Ray Bradbury would think about me ingesting his book via ear seashells. Like, Well, if you think about it, later on in the book, yes. Montag himself is listening to a book and ingesting the book via essentially ear seashells. He calls, them, he calls it the green bullet instead. Yes. So. Um, and I think somebody calls it seashells. One of them. That, no, they call the earbud seashells, but what uh, Faber makes later on, which is, is like the, yes. is the Bluetooth like two way thing where he can hear everybody talking. Yes, uh, that that is the uh, that is the <laughs> bullet that he refers to. So, I did think that just even right off the bat, it did a lot of like good social analysis, and really the whole thing is full of great social analysis. One of the things that stuck out to me was that like a complete lack of human interaction while being ultra connected leads to depression, anxiety, and loneliness and all these things that now all these studies are coming out about. Now that Mm -hmm. we're all glued to our cell phones, it's proving right the claims that he has about connectivity that uh, his wife, um, Montag's wife, is super connected. She's with quote unquote the family. Mildred, yeah, is, is, is paying attention through the walls to the family all the time. And yet, when we first really meet her, she's committed or attempted to commit suicide. Another wrinkle for you. All right. She attempts to OD, of course, mm-hmm. on opioids. Think about yes. it. Yes, which is another thing. Now, of course, that was also a thing back then. It was a big deal. It wasn't as as it wasn't as problematic as it has become now. I which, mean, we did already the book, fight the opium wars. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> Which, but that was that was a that was a little bit different. It's not the here's the pills that will make you feel better. Type yeah, of thing. it's true. Uh, but uh, yeah, another person jumped off a pill cap, uh, or or another yeah. person jumped off the top of a pill box is what how he says it. Yeah, and so just that whole analogy of what social media has actually done. That literally now it is a thing. It is a proven thing that sure enough, 
spending all your time on Facebook and Instagram and all these different things instead of actually having real conversation with people does lead to all of those awful things emotionally and, and mentally. Unless you share the TTWG podcast. Yeah, which is, I mean, we're real people having conversation. <laughs> Join in. Comment. Um, and uh, then I also really liked that immediately after that you get the conversation with Clarice where you get the idea of the antidote to all of these ills is actual conversation and debating, like conversing about ideas and life and what's going on instead of just being caught up in the notification and things are yelling at me and loud noises. And uh, that, uh, that whole thing was just very interesting to me. The other one that, that jumped out as far as like maybe predicting the future, there was a point where he talks about all the music being, quote, composed of trap drums. <laughs> and all I could think of was was our current music and I was like I wonder if the song he was listening to was a mumble rapper and I just I was just curious you know um, the the whole prediction of things moving towards beats and big and loud and bang and all that see now I'm talking like the book um, mm-hmm. is what zip bang bow <laughs> is very interesting to me the other thing that I have written down as far as sticking out from like the intro the the first section of the book is freaky needle dog oh. The mechanical hound. Yes. The uh, I I, the, I originally had this under my quote under uh, this because uh, we're going to talk about quotes here after a while, but I have this section highlighted because I love this description when we first meet the mechanical hound. Uh-huh. Uh, it's on page twenty two. If you have the nineteen sixty the, the sixtieth anniversary edition of Fahrenheit four fifty one, Montag slid down the pole, brass pole. He went out to look at the city, and the clouds had cleared away completely. And he lit a cigarette and came back to bend down and look at the hound. It was like a great bee come home from some field where the honey was full of poisonous wild, uh, of poison wildness, of insanity and nightmare. Its body crammed with the, that overrich nectar, and now sleeping the evil out of itself. <laughs> that, that I like that. That's a metal description of the mechanical hound. Yeah, and then it, it, he says all these things about like living but not living, alive but not alive. <laughs> you know, like all these things about the mechanical hound and. Uh, it is interesting as we move into the era of drones doing police work, you know, kind of things that who knows, you know, where we're headed as far as all that's concerned. But that that dog was freaky. That was the first thing in the book that as he described it, I was like, the heck am I? Like, what is this? Um, so, you know, there are other moments, obviously, to get there. But that was the first one where I was like, what on earth is this? So all that to say, there, there are a bunch of things that stuck out to me. A lot of them being things that I was like, holy crap, this did a pretty good job of, like, forecasting. Especially considering it was written in the 1950s. Yeah, 1950s. <laughs> now, to be fair, you know, there, there's also a lot of, like, comic books during that same era that predicted the exact same mm-hmm. things. But um, because of that, I'm going to give it, I, I'll say, like, a... And this is just off the first third of the book. Yeah, well, okay. So that that's the commentary is off the first... I'm, I'm a little hesitant to give direct reference to the back half of the book, just because I feel like it, the, a lot of the things that stuck out to me would be absolute spoilers. Mm. So I said we could spoil it. We could go all spoiler cast if you want. Okay. Fine, if we're going all spoiler cast, right? And I think the person that requested this episode uh, requested it, it, to go as in-depth as we can, so go all spoilers. Okay, well, spoiler moments... Some of the other ones that stuck out to me, when he is riding on the subway with the Bible open on his lap, trying to memorize, or just even really trying to read Ecclesiastes, and the denim's dentifrice keeps going. Denim's in the ba- d- uh, dandy detergent. <laughs> yeah, the in the background the whole time is running. Um, and I've always pointed to that as one of the more interesting things where uh, it, how Bradbury is able to use language to make it more unique, where I don't think it would make the same impact if it was done through like a visual medium uh-huh. or a, a different type of medium. I do believe how he wrote that and how it is portrayed there helps make it become a little bit different and more of a unique experience compared to a visual one, which would not... Uh, I don't think would have translated as well. Yeah, I do really wonder how this would translate. I know that, like, I think Netflix or somewhere HBO did HBO it. did did a recent series. I haven't seen it, but it's it's all right. Does it? I mean, does it? It doesn't follow the book really. Okay, it's more of a commentary of like how uh, it's more of a commentary on the whole social media type of thing, and okay. they go off in a different direction. Like Montag's not married, which that's not necessarily super important. Faber doesn't exist at all in this particular in the movie, so like it's. It's all right. It does a decent job. It's a lot better than the 1960s uh, 
movie. That movie is trash. Do not watch the 1960s <laughs> now movie. Now I kind of want to watch it. No, um, it's bad. But it's bo- it's boring. <laughs> it's just so boring. That's it's. I feel like it would be hard to make this boring. Um, oh, they do it. But I yeah, I'll take your word. But that moment is another one that really stuck out to me as far as being well done. It also was very reminiscent of on Inside Out where they keep sending up the memory <laughs> of the little ditty for gum. Uh, I triple don't know. dent, triple dent gum, triple dent, triple dent gum. Da, 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 da. Anyway, um, so that was really powerful. And then um, when you start unraveling things and you see the arguments against like knowledge and all of that is very interesting because that's the kind of thing that you hear often thrown out to to kind of counteract anything beyond trying to deal with what you can touch with your hands or see with TV is like, oh, but there's disagreement. That means none of it's true. Oh, the the argue, so the two main arguments that Beatty throws out because mm-hmm. uh, Montag steals a book as we find out and uh, his, cap, his, his boss, Captain Beatty, shows up at his house and kind of t- gives him a history lesson. Mm-hmm. And the two big things that Captain Beatty always rails on against bo- books is one, in fiction those people never existed so who cares like this is a bunch of fake stuff that has never happened so why is it even important Mm -hmm. and then for he says that nonfiction is even worse because you have people disagreeing with one another one expert yelling down the throat another expert like it doesn't make any sense to them Mm -hmm. and then when he eventually does confront montag then he's even quoting the same author disagreeing with himself like at Mm -hmm. one point in a book saying one thing and later on in the book saying something else um and just that kind of argument because I have literally had conversations with students about history where they're like, but is there a video of it? And I'm like, well, no. And they're like, well, then you can't trust it. And I'm like, well, that's you not how that... You can't even really trust video I was like, I was like, I would trust, you know, a thing with four different witnesses and seemingly vaguely conflicting things that all agreed on the central points way more than I would trust one video of it. Like, it's, it's just, you know, that's actually how it works, um, being a historian. And you see that mentality that he's espousing and yelling at Montag developing amongst our kids that are so plugged into Google and plugged into these things of like, if it's not coming out of the walls, <laughs> which in the case in this case are the gigantic TVs that take up you know, three quarters of a, or four quarters of a room. Oh, you take enough. up an entire room if you the, want to pay enough for it. Because yeah, the third one only costs a third of their salary, but don't, don't, don't you want me to be happy, Montag? Yeah. <laughs> and so... You never think about me. <laughs> yeah, and that's another thing that like it's just the the selfishness of social media and all of that. But anyway, the me 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 ness of consumerism. <laughs> yeah, so I just found that very interesting. The the I the arguments used against these things are arguments that I see popping up in students about why they shouldn't care about history or any kind of debate. Like uh, I was I was interacting with students the other day about current political events, and I had a student straight up just say that they didn't want to talk about this because it might offend someone. Should, shouldn't you not talk about this, Mr. Norman, because it might offend someone? And I was like, well, that's the problem. Like, if you don't talk about anything that offends anyone... Now, I'm not saying you should be offensive. That's two different things. Having a conversation that offends someone and being an arrogant jerk that offends someone are two different things. But talking about ideas... We should do, because otherwise we'll end up staring at the walls while the family talks. And that's one of the bigger points that he starts to develop towards as he talks about how... Uh, the spoiler alert they did not just people they did not just go out and just start banning all these books it's that people got upset and that's what gave them the opportunity to go in and start banning certain books and then on top of that people stopped reading them Uh and so it's not necessarily that the books were illegal and in fact uh the new movie kind of uh highlights this a little bit is that the books aren't illegal they're just all online which your dad likes to point out can Mm -hmm. probably what happened to them yeah they they can get rebooted right but the that that kind of plays into we had a little or they bit can of, change them yeah to, they can change them that that kind of plays into the conversation we had also about like that media just twists and uses things for its own motive like the fact that Jesus is part of the family mm-hmm. of the, this and he's selling detergent yeah on this TV show like it's like oh this is Jesus Christ and look here he's selling you this laundry detergent kind of thing and it's like wait a minute. That's that's a, but that's all society knows at this point in this dystopian future of who Jesus was was that he's this guy that sells you detergent and he's part of the family. Uh, that's one of the things that I always remember. Like they uh, kids that were shocked about is because at one point Montag starts 
tearing up the the Bible, and like mm-hmm. the kids are like, "Why is he doing that?" It's like he doesn't know any better. It's just another book to him. Yeah, he doesn't understand. Yeah, um, and so I do think it is really interesting though how they that was something else that I I we've had a little bit of a conversation about how they use the book of Ecclesiastes kind of almost contrasting but playing into the narrative of it's all pointless and meaningless because that just of course happens to be the book that he's reading and it's like it's all meaningless it's all pointless and it's this big thing that you have to wrestle with like wait a minute what does that mean what does that mean for me and that's the one that he's looking at as he's being you know yelled at so and it's the one that eventually spoiler is the one he remembers yeah it's the one he remembers when later on he's talking to those who have the books um, then he's like, aha, I have Ecclesiastes. So it's a, it's just a really interesting commentary. At the very end, um, you hear the idea, uh, a little bit of like funky future tech, that there is this guy who has figured out how if you have seen anything, you can remember it. Everyone has photographic memory and is just choosing to forget. <laughs> I wish that was true. Um, yeah, that's a little bit of a stretch. What he's, what I think they're really, like I always, what I always take home from that is that if you are truly engaged with something and if you truly uh, like actually read something and interact with it, then it becomes a part of you and you do that and you do remember a good chunk of what that you, it's not necessarily that you remember every word, word for word. You remember the idea at the center of it. That is the key thing that needs to be taken away. That can be then re echoed into the universe. Yeah. And I, uh, they, they hinted that, and then there is the, like, oh, everyone actually has a photographic memory part, which I would be interesting to hear explored. Well, look at what hap- look at what is the thing that helps Montag remember. The, uh... Seeing I'm, the bomb go off. I was going to say, well, there's a little bit of remembrance, I think, when he's in the barn, isn't there? He starts to remember a little bit in the barn, but whenever the book comes back to him clearly, and yeah. what's the importance of at the center of the book is once he sees... The city blow up. Yeah, when he sees the city explode, big time spoiler. <laughs> um, and uh, that's another another point. So anyway, I guess I'll, I'll give my rating here because okay. we've gotten super deep in this because of its good job of analyzing s- like sociological trends and things like that. Um, I would give this a a solid ninety ish. I mean, it's between an eighty five and a ninety for me. It's not one that I. I enjoyed reading for the reading of it, I guess if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. But the points it made, I really enjoyed. So it's not one that, like, if this author had one that wasn't making those kind of points, I would want to read his the style that he uses to write this book. But because of the salient points that he made, I was like, okay, I really liked those points. So that is where it's getting most of its rating for me, is on just the points that he was able to make. And even the parts that I didn't like like some of the artsy parts. Some of them you could probably throw out and the book would never notice and you, you wouldn't lose anything. But there were some of them where it did a really good job of capturing like the wrestling of emotion. Like when mm-hmm. he's reading poetry to the ladies. And it, oh, and the pen dropping and she starts yeah. crying. And like that did a really good... Them fidgeting and like not being uh, content with being silent and still. Yeah, yeah. And, and how it like, it just kind of herkajerks back <laughs> in the description between like him reading and them reacting, him reading and them reacting. And that was artsy, but it did a good job of mm-hmm. like the moment and pulling the moment and wait no and then he's getting the inter interjections um through his uh ear bullet you know and all these things that was well done and artsy so i i liked that because it, it made the point uh, but then there are other areas we talked about where you know he's he's talking about this weird vision of like what would happen if someone brought me a pair and it's like what <laughs> yeah yeah after he escapes the city uh like whenever he first escapes the city like when he's slaying in the river and like floating down the river and he's starting to think, I think that's fine. Yeah. I've always been fine with that. But once he gets up on land, there is one moment, I don't have it highlighted though, uh-huh. where when he gets up, up uh, at, like, on the land <coughs> and he's surrounded by forest and he feels overwhelmed by the land and yes. by the nature, I thought that that was a good uh, sign. And then he sees a deer. And, and then he, he sees a deer the... and he thinks it's the hound. Yeah. That was a good moment. But whenever he's <laughs> fantasizing about the barn, yeah, that, that that part really, that's the big the biggest thing that knocks it down to like a 95 for me. <laughs> uh-huh. That, that was one of those moments where like the book was finishing strong and then I was like, dang it, here's another one of these. Like, so. <laughs> but it, it does make an interesting comment about how we're all bang, bang, bang and we never can, we can't have the time to think about those. We can't, our brains do not want to suffer through those type of things. I think he was probably trying to make a commentary about that. Yeah. Um, and because of that commentary, so I'm going, I'm going, 85. 85 to 90, you know, upward, highest is 90. So a B plus. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a, a B, B plus. plus. 
an A in the commentary area, a, I'll give it a, a B minus in the I liked to read, like I enjoyed the reading kind of area of it. Um, but overall, very good book, and I would highly recommend it for anybody who likes anything as far as social commentary goes. Absolutely read it. If you're somebody who's interested in all of the stuff going on with social media now, all the like, wait, how much power have we given Facebook? How much power has this other thing gotten? Are we being too distracted by these things? This is a great book that just kind of helps you watch in a fictional stage those ideas come to their conclusions. Violence as well. Uh, like violence in media. That's another thing that oh, is... Oh, the white clown. Yeah, the white clown and how that leads to the bombing, essentially. <laughs> like, people are so obsessed with violence. And the moment, another one that was super artsy but also played its point well was when he's being he's being run down. <laughs> like, that was another one where it's like, there's a group of teenagers just out running people over for yeah. fun. And they're not getting arrested. The people who have books are getting arrested. Mm -hmm. Like, that idea is just like, what the heck? But it's it's playing out the ideas of what society and, promotes. And I do feel like that was that is another part where he gets a little bit preachy and becomes a little bit hyperbolic with that particular situation. Because uh, I think at one point he talks about how, like, in Clarice's class, spoiler alert, by the way, Clarice gets run over, by the uh -huh. way. Uh, in her class, like, uh, there's so many of them that die that it's... Uh, ridiculous! Like so many get gunshot, someone get uh, so many get uh, run over, so many uh, flip the car. Which in a different in a different situation that might be true, mm -hmm. but I do feel like that's kind of hyperbolic, at least for this particular area. Yeah, I mean it's because I will always have all the kids stand up, and then when I teach it, and I have them all stand up, and I'm like, all right, so he said this many die, you're dead. This many died, you're dead. This many died. Oh, we're stuck with this kid. Great. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, it's one of those things that I guess I didn't really notice it as being too hyperbolic given the fact that they're going around torching houses down. Like, and it, it's, the whole thing is hyperbolic. Yeah, and, and and that is just a small, like, footnote in the larger scheme of what he, where he goes with it. Uh-huh. But, yeah, that's that's something else that just the violence there was, was an interesting one. So, so there you go. There's my rating slash review. So is it together. fresh? I'm, I mean, it's a fresh, yeah. I mean, what, I don't even know what their limit is. I've seen one that was, like, certified fresh at, like, 78. It's it, it, Fresh is just positive reviews. Okay. So, yes, absolutely. I'll, I'll give this the little certified fresh stamp on our Rotten Tomatoes list here. So, uh, before we get into how to teach this book, there's one idea that wasn't touched upon that I want to touch upon real fast, and that was what Faber had to say about uh, different types of media. And one of the things that, so a lot of people said, why books? Why books? Why books? Well, part of the reason why is that books have that sustained thought and that longer, deeper, and uh, that sustained thought, that longer, deeper, and more concentrated, like, exploration of a particular topic. Mm -hmm. And, do, and uh, Professor Faber, he even points out that books aren't the answer, uh, but books contain, tend to contain it more than other mediums. Mm -hmm. And those other mediums can contain that stuff. Like, movies can have the same quality that the books have. Uh, music can have the same quality uh, that books have. Even art and painting, uh, paintings and photographs, they can have the same qualities that the books have. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing special about the books. It's just the quality of it, and books tend to have that quality more than other mediums. Yeah. And I always like to look at that whenever people start complaining about like new technologies, like the, like the social medias and mm -hmm. like the Snapchats and the Twitters and the Instagrams, is that part of the reason could just be that they are lacking the quality and often people will look or even YouTube people will look at the worst of a new medium as the reason why it's inadequate instead of the places where a quality could be contained within it yeah and I probably have a tendency to, to do that a little bit myself you know like kids will talk about watching TV or whatever and I'm like oh you should read a book instead kind of thing when in reality if you're watching the right things you could get the info um but yeah, that is a, that is a point that I, I kind of skipped Faber in general. I, not intentionally, but when, as I went through, I just hopped over him. <laughs> and that, and uh, with that said, on top of that, today in class, uh, so we can date when this uh, podcast dropped, I talked about active and passive, 
uh, engagement mm -hmm. where with a book you're uh, where a book you really need to be more actively engaged with it in mm -hmm. order for you to like take away from it things and with television even though you can be actively engaged with television often people are passive where it's just on and they're thinking about something else or they're surfing so social media with something else mm -hmm. and so they're not getting that interaction and that getting that deeper uh, quality content so that's kind of the bigger thing to look at there so teaching so mr norman if you're uh, how would you use this book in a social studies classroom um, I would say that the, the biggest thing that I could use this for, and, and probably I'll reference it for sure more now that I've read it, um, in a social studies classroom, is we do all kinds of things on current events analysis, and like today is Friday, so we, we went through and looked at a bunch of different current events topics, and uh, one of the things that crops up a lot is like how media affects people, and uh, there, there was a student actually talking about some serial killer or somebody that was caught and something happened and and uh, their entire thing was that they basically wanted likes they wanted to be famous on the internet and and it caused them to injure people and do all these awful things and record it and post it and so that very much plays into the themes you know of the book being able to be like okay well let's look at this passage and, and analyze what is going on currently and you know all these news topics that we've looked at and how does that play into this book? What do you think? Do you think that we should cut back on media consumption? Do you think that we should uh, make sure that people are interacting with ideas more than just violence? Like, do you, you know, basically having those conversations because in social studies, one of the big things, we're, we're becoming English, first mm -hmm. off, uh, especially in, in Missouri in the way that tests are structured. We're becoming an English class. Um, You're supposed to be nonfiction. I'm supposed to be fiction. Yeah, and, and uh, that's... Like, there's a lot of people who really, like, get upset about that. But I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing. Like, I think, I think it's good because the number one thing that I tell kids as far as the, por the point of the class is that we need to be learning how to interact with ideas and how to communicate, communicate ideas to others without yelling. <laughs> like, to how to have conversation and interact. How to have proper rhetoric. Yeah, and, and so I think that this book does a good job of of providing a lot of little examples you could use of that gone awry or that done well and the results of those things. Um, so that's probably the biggest area where I'm going to use it. Also, as you examine, you know, Cold War era, McCarthyism kind of thing, there's also the thing about, oh, no, there's a book called The Police, you know, kind of <laughs> thing. That's that's something else that could be touched on. Yes, he were, in fact, uh, Bradbury wrote this in response to uh, McCarthyism and the Red Scare mm -hmm. during that particular time. Uh, so how I've taught it in the past, uh, I've, in the past I've taught it in a more traditional sense. This is the book that where we really do look at what an anti-hero is, because Montag is an anti-hero because he's weak and he's not like a perfect ideal type of hero. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at it, and in the past we've looked at it through classic plot structure, uh, character development, specifically with foils and antagonists with Beatty. Uh, Captain Beatty is one of my favorite characters in all of, liter in all of the history of literature, <coughs> and he has done very excellently well. Uh, word choice and all that fun stuff, but uh, now that I'm moving more towards a type of con a type of curriculum that is more excerpt based, mm -hmm. I think I would use this more in, in, uh, alongside some other texts. So I got done reading here recently, Feed uh, mm -hmm. that I sent, uh, was talking to you about, and that's a YA novel. There would be certain parts of Feed that I might use excerpt based and pull that, and then pull some parts of Fahrenheit 451 and compare them, especially when talking about, as you were talking, uh, social media usage and uh, just the media in general and how they warp how we view the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, I'll just – this is an excellent source for a lot of, like, smaller excerpts that have a lot of stuff jam-packed in them. Yeah. And I would probably take that – take those and – uh, one thing I definitely would take is look at the I would take Beatty's speech mm -hmm. and put it up against Faber's speech and have them have a kind of a compare and contrast and see that that two how the two sides actually form an argument that they have to present. <coughs> yeah, I uh, I do like the fact that they are they're almost like the the, the good devil. Yeah, and I was the, say, angel. the little angels on his shoulder, the good angel and bad angel kind of thing on his shoulder. Um, talking back and forth through his head the whole time. I forgot to ask you this earlier. Do you think Beatty just desperately wanted Montag to talk books with? Um, like he wanted him, he wanted Montag to continue to be on his side uh -huh. and uh, and burn all the books and whatnot. But he wanted, but he would want Montag to join him in both keeping the status quo and burning the books, but still talking about them. 
Um, that's an interesting, like, potential plot because he does, he knows all the books. He's read them all. Mm -hmm. Um, and so somebody might need to check his house, but... (laughs) No, you're allowed to keep a book. A fireman, firemen Uh are allowed to cook, take a book for 24 hours. And if they do not turn it in and burn it in 24 hours, they'll show up and burn it for them. So, so So he's read all these things by confiscating them. He takes them, he reads them, and burns them. That is interesting. I do... I do wonder a little bit, though, like, based on how he argues, if maybe there is a little bit of truth to Montag's rant about maybe it seemed he wanted to die, you know, Mm -hmm. that... Well, why would you give a lunatic a flamethrower and then yell at him? Yeah, there seems to be a little bit of that, and I think that that would play actually very well with the idea of the intertwined uh, ecclesiastical thing, because... If you haven't read the book of Ecclesiastes, essentially the conclusion that it comes to is like everything is meaningless unless you have a God given purpose. Like, otherwise, outside of that, nothing has a purpose, and you might as well just go ahead and slough off, right? So, I think that you kind of see the contrasting characters there of someone who is finding meaning and someone who has none of it. And so, the someone who has none of it is doing the same thing as jumping off a pill bottle, as he puts it, by saying, Here, fine, you have a meaning, go ahead. Right? That's kind of how I viewed that interaction. Not that he was trying to draft him uh, in that sense. All right. So as you can attest, I have a lot of uh, earmarks in this book. Yes. And so I'm just going to go through and just hit some of them. Okay. Uh, not all of them are quotes, but most of them are quotes. Uh, I want to get your opinion real fast on how Clarice's <coughs> school, how the schools in the future were structured. All right. So if you remember, here's where it talks about it. An hour of TV class, an hour of basketball or baseball or running, another hour of transcription history or painting pictures and more sports. Uh, but do we never ask questions, or at least we don't, and they just run more answers at you, bing, 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 and us sitting there for four more hours of film teacher. Um, so what's your opinion on how like their future uh, schooling goes? So my opinion on that is, once again, aside from the like the sports and the art, uh, which we've cut a lot of physical activity out of school. Um, but the film teacher, and they're the, the, my favorite quote from that is that they're just, like, it's just answers. Mm-hmm. Like, they're slinging answers at us. And that's what I feel like, if we have a big issue with education right now, it's that we're slinging answers, not allowing them to find them and can come up with them. Mm-hmm. And so I'll have students where I'll ask them a question that, how do you, or what do you think about this? And they say, well, what's the answer? And I, said, I asked you what you think. I don't know what you think about it. Like, tell me. What do you think about it? Oh, well, this, this, and this. Is that the right answer? And I'm like, yeah. that's, and not, that's not what I'm, I'm asking you what you think. Like, there's not a right answer to that. Now, there could be dumb answers, but there's not a right answer, right? If I say, what do you think about what's going on right now in government, and you say, fluffernutter, right? <laughs> well, that's dumb. That doesn't have anything to do with it. But I think that we are, with the era of Google, um, training students that there are, you know, one-line answers to every question, even philosophical ones. And Out of the nursery, ba- uh, into the college, back into the nursery, that's your intellectual pattern for the past five centuries or more? Yep, there you go. <laughs> that's uh, on page 52, by the way. That's just one of my uh, things that I highlighted that I like. But, yeah, I agree with you. Like, like a lot of students complain that I'm a quote-unquote hard grader, mm-hmm. but I, don't, I give you a passing grade if you have the correct answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I give you a better grade if you can prove why you have the correct answer. That is what I do. I've designed mine where if you have the correct answer, all right, good. You get a passing grade. You did what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. If you want a higher grade, you have to show your work, essentially. Mm -hmm. All right, let me me see if I can find my other ones real fast uh, that I like to highlight. Uh, Most of mine that I like to highlight are actually near the very end. Uh, 113. Uh, page 113 in part three, Beatty, whenever Montag is holding the flamethrower at him, says, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a way to hold a man to a gun and force him to listen to your speech, speech away. Well, what will be this time? Why don't you belt Shakespeare at me, you fumbling snob? There's no terror, Cassius, in your threats, for I'm an arm so strong and honesty that they pass by me like an idle wind, which I respect not. That's a quote from Julius Caesar, and I love Julius Caesar, and so uh-huh. that's why I, I highlight that, and I always like to r- talk about that, and I freak out anytime we read it, and then I start doing all my Julius Caesar uh, nonsense. That See, I like that's to do. that's that part of that speech where it just makes me think that he's a man with no purpose or hope. He has <laughs> not found a purpose or hope, and so he's like, "All right, burn me." 
the other thing that we didn't really touch on that I have a lot of quotes uh, uh, highlighted around is with Granger when he's talking about death. I've always found how he talks about death mm -hmm. as an interesting way. And just some of the quotes that he has based around there. Uh, he's talking about when his grandfather passed away. Uh, the world uh, was bankrupt of 10 million fine actions the night he passed on. The long cutter might as well just be not been there at all. The, gr the gardener will be there a lifetime. Grandfather's been dead for all these years, uh, but he lift my skull by God in the convulsions of my brain. You'll find the big ridges of his thumbprints there. He said I hated a Roman name status quo. And basically saying that whenever someone dies, it's not that person that we're missing, it's that the things that that person did to the world. And, he, and the contrast there is Montag at the time is saying, I don't even know if I'd care if my wife died. And that's because his wife... Yeah, he, he talks anything. about, like, I remember her hands, but they're always just hanging, hanging by her side, you know, yeah. something along those lines. She didn't do anything in the world, and so I've always found that, and I, I always will point to that. For I always, always quote things like that when people are in solace for losing a loved one. Yeah, right. I, I really do. I That line, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, grass cutter, like, mm -hmm. the grass cutter... Nobody the, remembers. The grass cutter could have been there for an hour. It, uh, the grass cutter can do their job in, in an hour. A gardener, it takes a lifetime. Yeah. Um, that idea of, like, keeping things the same doesn't take anything. Uh, cutting things down doesn't take anything. Building stuff takes stuff. Yes. Um, All right. So before we end it, we're, almost, we're at the very end, I promise. So as Mr. Norman said in the spoiler part of it, at the very end of the novel, all the hobos they meet, Granger and the rest of the hobos, they all represent a book. Mm-hmm. So, if you were to be a hobo, mm -hmm. what would be your book? Who? What would you? What book would be the one that you memorized? Oh man! For the New World Order, per um, se. I'll I'll let you think for a minute. Yeah, I've got to think because I got mine. I because I I've taught this book, so I have to t I answer okay. the question. Uh, my book is the Tragedy of Julius Caesar because I already kind of know that book and I love that book. The the debates of power and of uh, friendship and loyalty and all that at the center of it, uh, that would be the book that I would, I would choose. I know it's a little sexist, but it, <laughs> uh, well, poor Portia, she eats burning hot coals. Uh, uh, but it is an excellent book that shows, like, what, what, what should one, as Kanye West once said, no one man should have all that power. Him and Brutus <laughs> no would have gotten along very well. And also, I already know, I quote it all the time. Pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth, I am meek and gentle with these butchers. Woe to the hand that shed this costly blood. Over thy wounds, now do I uh, prophesize, like dumb mouths do ope their ruby lips. I think it's funny that you, you turn into, like, you switch to Shakespeare voice when you start <laughs> quoting it. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil men do uh, live after him. The good is often interred of the bone. So let it be with Caesar. <laughs> the noble Brutus had once said that Caesar was ambitious. All right, so if you're a hobo in the post-apocalypse... And you need a Caesar. You need, a, you need a, a tragedy of Julius Caesar. Hit a brother up. Yeah, come on to <laughs> southeast Missouri and find him wandering on the tracks of Portageville. <laughs> um, I would say, uh, honestly, just given uh, my, my brain, the thing that I would want running through it, and I don't know if this is a little bit cheatery, it's only a piece of a book, sort of, depending on how you look at it, and that would be the book of Philippians written by Paul. Um, okay. That, that would be the one that I think I would want flowing through my head. Um, just because there, there is so much in there about, you know, living a life of joy because of what Christ has done for us. And that's what I want in my head. Like, if there's a post-apocalypse kind of just awful things going on around me all the time, I, that's what I need is, is the joy <laughs> pumping through me. So I'm going with that one, Philippians. All right. So uh, that was our review of Fahrenheit 451. What's your thoughts? Uh, mention them in the comments because they help the algorithm. But <laughs> until next time, my name's been Paul Davidson. My name is the Lord willing, will be Scott Norman. And we've been two... Dumb woke guy.